in the UK. Thank you, the Cabinet Secretary General Members. That brings us to an end of the statement. We now move on to well business from the Green Party, and I'm going to call Ross Greer on a, to move motion 2809. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Ross Greer to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to move the motion in my name. Every young person in Scotland has a right to education. It's enshrined in international law. And young people with additional support needs have a right to support to ensure that they can get the high quality of education they deserve. That's enshrined in the Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act. And by some measures, we're doing not too bad. Currently, Scotland is ranked highly amongst international measures on inclusion in education. The OECD puts us alongside Norway, Sweden and Finland as part of a small group of countries with highly inclusive education, well above the average. This is good company to keep in international educational rankings. But by other measures, Scottish education is not doing nearly as well as it should be. And one of those is how we support our children and young people with additional support needs. In schools across the country, additional support for learning staff work exceptionally hard to ensure an inclusive environment for young people with additional support needs. This means supporting pupils with a range of additional needs, whether it's those who've learned English as an additional language, who have dyslexia, behavioural difficulties, or who are on the autistic spectrum. Children and young people with additional support needs are by no means a homogenous group. Individual support is important for every child, but with those with these support needs, it is absolutely essential. And it requires dedicated, skilled staff to deliver it. The importance of teachers and assistants qualified to provide additional support cannot be underestimated. Today, there are just under 3,000 ASL teachers and a further 5,500 additional support needs assistants in Scotland. They're providing a vital service to over 150,000 pupils in our schools. That's over a fifth of all Scottish pupils who have an identified additional support need. For those who don't enjoy the mental arithmetic, that's about one dedicated teacher and two support staff for every 52 pupils with an identified additional support need. With the level of individual support required though, as already mentioned, this just isn't enough. And it's less than where we were just a few years ago. In 2010, there were just under 3,400 ASN teachers. That's a drop of around 400 staff in just a few years. In that same period of time, the number of young people with an identified additional support need has gone up. Since 2013, we've identified an additional 22,000 young people in Scottish schools with an additional support need. Mark MacDonald. I'm grateful to Ross Gear for taking the intervention. He will know that the statistical collections were changed in 2010 and now capture a much broader range of what would be classed as additional support need. For example, a child who may suffer a bereaved family bereavement during the course of an academic year, which requires a short period of support, would be captured within the figures where previously they would not have been. Ross Greer. I absolutely take Mark McDonald's point, and that's why it's essential. And now that we've found there are such a large number of young people in our schools with additional support needs, and these young people had them before 2010, it was just a change in measurement, that it's absolutely unacceptable that in that same period of time, we've lost hundreds of members of specialist support staff. As we know, these children and young people, children and young people from deprived backgrounds are far more likely to have an additional support need. So demand for support has gone up, and it comes on top of existing needs and educational barriers. But there's been a significant reduction in the staff there to give this essential support. Resources are already stretched thin. With cuts to council budgets, the situation is likely to get worse. Since 2010, local authorities have endured year on year of austerity measures, amounting to a near 7% drop in their total real terms revenue. If the government is to meet the targets it has set for itself on closing the attainment gap, a new approach is quite urgently needed. As mentioned, these are young people for whom the attainment gap is considerable. Only a third of pupils with additional support needs achieved one or more hires last year. That's compared to two thirds of pupils without, without an additional support need. And whilst the level of attainment amongst young people with ASN is rising, something that we all welcome, it does not take away from the very unequal reality that these young people face. And with additional support needs disproportionately affecting pupils from lower income families and areas of deprivation, progress here must be made as part of the wider effort to give every young person a fair start in life. But the specific needs of individual young people with additional support needs cannot be lost in that wider debate. As it stands, we are concerned that this is not being given adequate regard. 
The Cabinet Secretary's delivery plan has one fairly cursory mention of ESM, saying that they will consider the impact of issues such as looked after status, additional support needs and English as an additional language, before quickly moving on. Without action, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition has warned of a lost generation of vulnerable children arising out of this combination of spending cuts, staffing cuts and a rise of pupils requiring support. Similar concerns over cuts have already been raised by the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland, by the EIS, by parents and by young people themselves. Young people and their parents and carers are acutely aware of what's happening. Enable Scotland have reported that more than 7 in 10 pupils with a learning disability say that they do not get enough help and time from teachers. 94% of their parents do not feel that the schools receive enough resources to work with them. And it is teachers who engage with their pupils on a daily basis who know how to provide the best support. No one in this debate, I'm sure, is questioning the dedication and the effort of teaching and support staff. But what teachers need is the time and the resource that will allow them to give the individual assistance that pupils with additional support needs, which all pupils require. When class sizes become too large, when teachers' time is stretched too thin, when specialist ASN teachers or support staff have been cut, that assistance cannot be adequately provided. The Scottish Government must ensure that local authorities have the budgets they need to ensure those resources are available to our schools. The Green Manifesto for this year's election set out a desire to recognise the skills and experience of additional support for learning teachers and restore a career structure that allows teachers to stay in the classroom. In Finland, additional support for learning is a promoted post. That is something that I've raised with the Cabinet Secretary and that I'd like to continue exploring with the Scottish Government, with teachers and with their trade unions. Today, we are asking the Scottish Government to commit to bringing forward a budget that will allow councils to ensure more additional learning support teachers and support staff to be present in our schools to reverse the cuts of recent years. And it is worth mentioning that again. We are not trying to simply raise capacity to add to what was already there. What was there has been disappearing. Hundreds of staff have disappeared in recent years. We need to get back to where we were a few years ago before we can start improving on that point. We need to meet the increasing demand as more pupils are identified as requiring additional support. All of our young people deserve a quality education centered around their needs. I hope that the Scottish Government will take on board the suggestions, not just coming from ourselves, but from trade unions, educational experts, charities, parents, carers, and of course, young people themselves. Politicians often in speeches come away with entirely cliched quotes from the last time they were in a taxi, but I was in a taxi last night, and without raising it myself, the driver brought it up himself, and I, I thought it, it was too, too good, and it had to be raised today. The taxi driver that I had last night has a contract with Glasgow City Council to take young people with additional support needs from one school to another. And what he said to me, totally unprompted, didn't know who I was, uh, was that what he wants is for politicians to spend a day, to spend a week with the staff in these schools. He and his brief encounters with them once a day is so impressed by the dedication, the effort, the compassion that these teachers and support staff are giving and the additional support that they desperately need to provide every young person with the educational opportunities they deserve. I now call John Swinney to speak to and move amendment 2809.3 up to six minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I welcome this opportunity to take part in an important debate on the vital support for children and young people in our school system within Scotland. And can I begin with a point of agreement with Ross Greer that I don't enter this debate in any way questioning the commitment of teachers or other professionals who are supporting young people with additional support needs in their children. In our schools, I think they, uh, they have a very, very demanding job which requires enormous commitment. Um, I spend a lot of my time, frankly, engaging with people on these questions and in seeing the delivery of excellent practice in different educational settings within Scotland, in special schools, in mainstream schools, in every context. And what unites that approach is the fundamental uh, foundation of the government's approach to education policy, which is our wider approach of getting it right for every child. So whatever the child's circumstances, in whatever setting, whatever their um, experience, their background, their, their, their circumstances, uh, we accept our responsibility to do everything we possibly can do to ensure that we turn getting it right for every child 
uh, away from just being a slogan, but into the experience that young people have of their education and wider support system within Scotland, particularly if they have uh, individual needs which require to be addressed as part of the system. Now, Ross Greer has made a number of remarks in the course of his contribution about the disproportionate cuts to local authorities' budgets, and I want to take a little bit of time to address that particular point. Audit Scotland, on behalf of the Accounts Commission, published their report into local authority spending this week and revealed that far from being treated unfairly, reductions in real terms funding of councils since 2010-11 are the same as the reduction in the Scottish Government's total budget over the same period. Also, we know, uh, one moment. Uh, also, we know that last year, rather than there been any cut in funding, spending on additional support for learning increased by £24 million to £579 million. Of course, I give one. Ross Creer. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the intervention. Is he not aware that uh, the figures he cited can only be brought about by excluding non-domestic rates, something which even SPICE doesn't do when it produces the figures? When those figures are produced, it shows a disproportionate cut for our local authorities when the austerity from Westminster is passed on. John uh, well, well, the, 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 the total analysis is the analysis of the Accounts Commission which I have cited, which is regularly cited to the Government as the touchstone of authority on these questions. And I simply informed the debate about the conclusions of the Audit Scotland report, which demonstrate exactly the point that I have made. I am committed to ensuring that all children and young people receive the support that they need to support their learning in school, and there have been a number of developments to support this as part of the Government's agenda. Uh, we've established the attainment challenge, which is designed to close the attainment gap and to support children and young people affected by socio-economic deprivation to secure improved educational outcomes, which will also bring with it new resources that will be applied to the delivery of school education. We have developed and published the National Improvement Framework, which is intended to drive both the excellence and equity in Scottish education through new and better information to support individuals' children's progress, which is at the heart of delivering the Getting It Right for Every Child agenda, um, we will be in a better position to identify where improvement is needed and we will have a better understanding of children's needs to ensure that these can be supported effectively. And the consultation on the governance review is designed also to ensure that our schools are equipped with the approaches and the skills to ensure that they can best meet the needs of children as they present themselves in individual schools. Now, the debate also touches on the presumption of mainstreaming, um, a, pr a principle that was established in law in 2000. That legislation offers children and young people with additional support needs the opportunity, where it best suits their needs, to learn in their communities and to sustain and build the friendships and the relationships that will last through their lives. The legislation also allows for exceptions to be made for children and young people whose needs may be best met through specialist prov provision. And I have seen young people with additional support needs operating satisfactorily and well supported in mainstream education, but also um, within a special uh, educational provision. And the key point is that we must make judgments and our education system must make judgments about how the, 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 the needs of individual young people are met and to ensure that is done appropriately. And the government also takes forward its responsibilities through the additional support for learning legislation, which was passed by Parliament in 2004. And that act fundamentally changed the way in which young people and children are supported in schools. Moving away from a, a, model, a model of medical deficit to a legislative framework which focused on barriers to children's and young people's learning within our school system. And the additional support for learning legislation gives a fundamental uh, uh, base to the approach that the government uh, takes on all of these questions. Um, the, uh, the Scottish Government is determined to ensure that we use the resources available to us um, wisely in partnership with our local authority partners to ensure that we meet the needs of young people with additional support needs. It is absolutely vital that every child, no matter their background or their circumstances, are effectively and well supported by the provision that we can make available. That provision will vary um, from uh, setting to setting, but what is crucial is that we make the correct judgments about the assistance that young people require, that we meet their needs to the full, and the government is absolutely committed to taking forward an agenda based on that objective to ensure that we deliver equity and excellence for every child and young person within Scotland. And I move the motion in my name. The amendment, Cabinet Secretary. 
<laughs> uh, I now call Liz Smith to speak to and move amendment 2809.1. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I move the amendment in my own name? I, I think in the current educational climate, uh, it's probably not surprising uh, that media uh, attention is obviously on some of the other issues, and it's uh, all too easy to let the focus on additional support uh, for learning take a back seat. And of course, that's just not the way it should be and why we have very great sympathy actually for many of the comments made in the uh, Green parties, uh, not only in Ross Greer's speech but in the, the motion, although we do have a little bit of a problem with the, the last bit of that because of the specific focus uh, of uh, budgeting which I'll come to a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but that said, there's absolutely no disagreement about the need to ensure that every child uh, with ASN receives the appropriate help in the efficient and timely manner, uh, and that support extends uh, to the home and to the local community, as the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said. Uh, it's not just about what happens uh, in schools. And I think that's been very much a feature of the additional support uh, needs legislation, particularly the point that was um, the adaptation of that legislation in 2009. Um, but I do notice uh, that many of the comments that are made to people who work in this uh, sector that there remains an issue about some of the data that is collected and just uh, how uh, clear that data is in measuring the efficacy of the policy. Notwithstanding that, the statistics that we uh, do have obviously uh, speak for themselves and Ross Greer has outlined uh, some of these. I think they're right uh, to make these points. And that includes, obviously, concerns that have been put to us uh, about the number of uh, educational psychologists, for example, because, as we've said uh, before, the complexity uh, of the definition uh, of uh, ASN uh, is increasingly diverse, actually. Um, Mark MacDonald uh, alluded to that, too. Um, and that definition puts an additional pressure uh, on staffing. Uh, and could I say at this stage uh, uh, something I think is very important about ensuring that those with the expertise do have the appropriate access uh, to ESN work. And I, uh, can I just pick up a comment that was made uh, back in the Residential Child Care Qualification Report of 2012, which was very supportive of uh, Scottish Government's uh, desire to have a professional qualification throughout uh, the profession, uh, all very important indeed. Um, but there was a, a little bit of concern that the, the necessity of having a level nine qualification for uh, many of the, 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 the staffing uh, was just a bit too restrictive and that was putting uh, great pressures on some of the uh, schools that have residential uh, facilities, not just in terms of attracting the right uh, members of staff to work in that profession, but also in terms of uh, putting considerable stresses and strains on retraining and upskilling their existing staff and, of course, as a result, having to pay enhanced salaries. And I think um, Mr Swinney and I have... Uh, two of these smaller schools in our, in our own local area, and th that was a point made to us. Uh, we have to be mindful uh, of that situation. I think one of the other uh, very important aspects of this debate uh, is about the, the question of mainstreaming. And it, it, the Cabinet Secretary is right when he uh, alludes to the fact that that's a fundamental um, position uh, of all parties, I think, uh, within this Parliament. And in fact, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that the OECD uh, praised uh, Scotland particularly for the inclusive approach to education. But sometimes mainstreaming it is not the best answer for individual uh, children. In fact, very much not the right answer. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't uh, have a, a system whereby mainstreaming is an accepted basis simply because we like the idea of mainstreaming. I think it's very important that we have to look at the educational uh, values, and I think the Cabinet Secretary uh, made that point himself, because that, that is hugely significant in providing the very specialist services for specialist needs, some of which are in the private sector, but some of them sometimes uh, mean that a child has to go to another local authority rather than their own. I think that's a, a very uh, important uh, point. Could I just uh, raise uh, one, one issue um, which uh, follows, I think, the event that some of us attended yesterday, which was the, the launch of the uh, step programme, um, which uh, is uh, Kenny Logan's um, approach to ensuring that all children, no matter whether they have uh, additional support needs or not, are involved in ex physical literacy exercises, which help them to stimulate other aspects of literacy. And the Cabinet Secretary has been very supportive uh, of the step programme, and I think we were very impressed by the compelling results 
which have uh, gone with some of the pilot studies, particularly for those children who do have additional support needs. So may I just finish, uh, Presiding Officer, on the fact that I think there are many recommendations that have been put to us by those in the sector. And I think that it's very important that we see this in the context of the round whereby we are looking after the individual best interests of every child, but on top of that, the resources and the way that the attainment fund is developed. I think we have to ensure that that is carefully looked at because I think that could give long-term advantages to those who have additional support. I call Daniel Johnson. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to thank the Greens for this motion this evening because I think it raises important issues. Important because I think we need to be frank about the fundamentals of, of how education is being delivered in our schools. And I'd also like to thank Ross Greer for raising so consistently the issue of additional support since he came into this parliament. It goes to the very heart of how we deliver education. Because if we are serious about child-centered education, about getting it right for every child, then we need specialists and support staff in order to deliver it. And if we wish to deliver the world-class education, there is simply no substitute for funding. I'm sure that every member in every council area in this chamber has seen the impact of budget cuts to our local authorities in terms of lost janitors, lost librarians, lost music staff. And we've heard the stories from teachers as they struggle to fund the basics, whether it's stopwatches for labs, textbooks for classrooms, or even photocopying. And that's why this debate is important. Because if we want to deliver for our children, to build the society and the economy of the future, schools need staff and professionals to deliver that education. And it needs to be funded properly. The record of this SNP government is that on both counts, they have presided over decline. We have fewer staff in our schools, and the impact of the budget cuts is all too visible in our schools. On additional support needs, we have seen rising numbers of children with additional support needs, as Ross Greer rightly pointed out. Since 2010, we've seen a 120% rise. There are now over 150,000 children who need some sort of additional support to learn in schools. Now, that's not bad news. I treat that as good news. The growth does not mean that we have twice as many people who have these issues and struggle to learn. It's a sign that we now know who these people are and what their needs are. It means we are no longer writing off the dyslexic child as being stupid, the autistic spectrum child as difficult, or the ADHD child as naughty. But while we are better understanding additional support needs, the government has not matched that with the additional resources that are required. Indeed, the opposite is true. Additional support needs staff are down by 8%. We have lost almost 500 specialist teachers from our schools, a decline of 13%. We are seeing these staff leave and retire and not replaced. The support and intervention is now often left to classroom assistants or added to teachers' existing workload. But these cuts aren't just confined to those supporting specific additional support needs. Over the last five years, we have seen a fall across support staff in our schools. We've seen lab assistants cut by half, technicians down by 20%, librarians down by a quarter. In total, we've lost nearly 3,000 staff from our schools. The picture that is forming is one where we are simply not supporting education in the way that is required. Our schools don't just need teachers, they need a full complement of support staff and professionals to deliver education at the standard our country needs and tailored to each child's requirements. And it's no mystery as to why we've seen this decline. It's not about how schools are organised, managed, or governed, it is because local authorities have seen half a billion pounds worth of cuts to their funding. If you cut from local government, this is what happens. Education accounts for 44% of local government spending. So cuts on this scale have a real and immediate and inevitable consequence on our schools. And the government's response to this? To reform governance of our schools, to blame bureaucracy, to launch more than a dozen consultations and reviews in education. But whether the government centralises or decentralises, whether the government creates new public bodies or scraps them, it will not add a single teacher to our schools and it won't add a single member of support staff. Over the last few weeks, the Education Committee has been examining written evidence from teachers. The picture is one of change fatigue. Endless changes to what they have to teach and how they have to teach. What they want is continuity and support not more change. As one head teacher put it to me in my constituency, he doesn't 
want more control over his budget. He has responsibility for most of it anyway, uh, as much as 80%. What he wants is funding to employ enough janitors so he doesn't have to unblock the loose at lunchtime when he doesn't have any janitorial cover. This is a political choice. This government does not have to preside over falling staff levels. It does not have to cut support when we have, we provide, uh, that we provide the children we need it. So let's back this motion. Let's see the Scottish Parliament put forward a progressive budget based on progressive taxation to use the tax raising powers to invest and protect our education in this country, not cut it. Thank you. We now move on to the open speeches. We're already over time, so can I have speeches of less than four minutes, please, or it will have to come off the closing speeches. So Patrick Harvey, followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. The, uh, my colleague Ross Greer began with a recognition of the dedication and talent of ASN teachers and support staff. I think that's something we can all recognise. But also he set out why we need to raise the revenue that's necessary, that we can support them better to do their jobs. The, uh, the, the Scottish Government's approach, uh, including its delivery plan, recognises that ASN is an issue that needs to be considered. But if, if ministers are serious about closing the attainment gap, and I believe that they are, then this issue needs to move up the agenda significantly. And that's the, the, the reason why the Greens have brought this motion. Children and young people, particularly from lower income families and areas of deprivation, have disproportionately high uh, additional support needs. And cuts to local authorities where education is the biggest spend will not close that gap or create a more equal society. Children and young people with additional support needs are also significantly more likely to be excluded from school. Per thousand children, 69 with additional support needs uh, were excluded in the most recent set of annual figures compared to 16 without. Uh, just short of 9,700 children with additional needs were excluded from school uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the latest figures, 2,000 more exclusions compared with 2010-11. Uh, children and young people getting support for mental health problems are twice as likely to be excluded from school as those without. It's another link to demonstrate how uh, ASN needs need to be uh, part of the closing the attainment gap agenda. The Rowntree Foundation also tells us that children living in low-income households are nearly three times as likely to experience mental health problems uh, than their more affluent peers. One in five children lives in poverty in Scotland. That so many children experience, experiencing poverty and mental health problems don't have access to sufficient or appropriate resources and support uh, and are being excluded from school as a result is a shameful failure. Now, while Overall patterns of attendance, qualification, and leaver destinations have been slowly improving. Children with additional support needs continue to face these increasing levels of exclusion. The lack of ASN provision in schools can also result in the misidentification of a child's behavior as simply disruptive, uh, a misunderstanding of the causes of their behavior, and then a limited exploration of the possible positive ways to engage with that child in line with their particular needs. Uh, that can be the result. And this is a complex process. The Greens are not here today to pretend that there's a simple or easy uh, uh, agenda to respond to. But that reality, that difficulty and complexity of this issue demonstrates why why well-trained, well-resourced professionals equipped to identify educational uh, objectives in line with a child or young person's additional needs is absolutely vital and giving those professionals the resources that they need to do their job. Um, according to the uh, NESUWT, 92% of teachers said that their school doesn't always get access uh, to the external support uh, to give uh, pupil support where it's needed. Uh, and this must be a, 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 an overwhelming and bewildering experience for parents in particular. Uh, the assessment processes, accessing services, going through uh, the child's eligi eligibility, that in itself is a complex and emotionally draining experience. And ASN teachers and support staff are necessary to help them through the process too. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I know that uh, Ross Green and John Swinney have disagreed about the, the budgetary implications in the past, but let's remember the cuts to local authorities 
priorities which are yet to come if Derek Mackay was right about the cuts we're anticipating to the Scottish budget. It's time for the revenue to be raised to meet the need that our children and young people so clearly have. James Dornan, followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'll try not to take the four minutes up there. Uh, do appreciate your short Don't time. try, Mr Dornan, do it. <laughs> you should not get any a debate with me now. I'll never make it. OK, my apologies. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Daniel Johnson's contribution, and one of the comments he made just at the end was, for me, crucial to this whole debate. He talked about political choice, and he's right. You know, where the government puts their money is a political choice, and what they've done is they've made sure that the local authorities have not suffered any way the, uh, any more than the, the Scottish Government has done. The Scottish Government don't sack teachers. The Scottish Government haven't got rid of the, the psychologists. It's local authorities that have done that. It's local authorities that make a political choice to, get to, to not hire the teachers that are required. It's local authorities that, that decide to close down some schools for children with the assisted support needs. There's no point standing up. I have no point. I have no time to take interventions. They, they, they close down schools that are working well with some children with, with the, the assisted learning needs and then put them into mainstream. When some of these children have already left mainstream school because they weren't capable of it, these choices come not from here, but from local authorities. So that's the, the money we suffer a, a budget cut, that budget is, is then shared out but, uh, among local authorities and amongst others. We have to be realistic about the money we've got. But the Scottish Government is spending a lot of money to try and help uh, children with assisted support needs. A lot of money. They, 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 in 2010, they started the, with their autism strategy, which has done a lot of good things since then, and there's still much more to do. We do not have an endless bucket of money that we, we can solve every problem with. We have to make decisions. We've made wise decisions. We've made decisions spending on education. We've made sure that education is protected as much as it can. But when it gets down to those local decisions, they are for local authorities to make. They are not for the they are not for the, they, they are not for the Scottish Government to make. The, and, and, and then, you, and then you, you say that you're not, the, the head teacher you spoke to says he's got 80 odd percent of his budget, but he doesn't want that extra money. I find that very strange. I mean, it's, it's just weird if he, if he feels, it, so there's, there's a head teacher out there that doesn't want to have control over extra money, uh, which could be used then to support these children with assisted support needs. So it just, well, he could, he could, use could you stop money. having private conversations, my, please? My apologies, my apologies, President Officer. The, the, the money has been given to local authorities. Local authorities have made their decisions about how to spend it. And don't get me wrong, these are not easy decisions. Everybody's having to make difficult decisions. But let's make sure that if we're putting pressure on people to make decisions at that local level, that we're putting it on at the local level where it should be. And, and, and Ross Greer talked earlier about the, uh, the, the impact uh, what do you, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition's press release talked about the, the cuts in public services mean that Scotland faced the prospect of a lost generation of children and young people with additional support needs, making it extremely difficult for the Scottish Government to close the ed educational attainment gap. And that was because of Philip Hammond's budget. That's what that was about. So, but, so, but again, I asked the same question. How, sorry, President Officer, I asked the same question. If we're accepting that Philip Hammond's budget is making it hard for, for the, the local authorities to do it, then how can we possibly, if, we, if we've got less money, how can we possibly be putting out more money that we don't have? Now, I accept that we, uh, you're short of time, and uh, that's three and a half minutes, and I want to try and stay in your good books for a change, so I'm going to finish at that point. Thank you. Tavish Scott, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. Can I come between James Dornan and, and, uh, and uh, Daniel uh, Johnson in, in, uh, and, and, and speak through you, of course, uh, presiding officer, but actually, uh, if I could just gently say to Mr Dornan, but you do have choices. Every government has choices. Of course they do, because Mr Swinney, when he was the finance secretary, I know you're agreeing with me, but I'm going to talk through the presiding officer, otherwise she'll shout at me as much as she'll shout at me. Um, uh, because Mr Swinney, when he was the uh, finance secretary, of course had the choice as to what extent of the changes, I'll use the word changes rather than cuts, uh, the changes to local government finance uh, would, would apply to local uh, councils uh, as to any other part of the public sector. So there's that choice, and I accept that's the choice that the, the government of the day have made. But there's also, of course, the choice uh, about using the tax powers of the parliament. Now, again, perfectly sensible and, uh, or maybe not sensible at times, debate about, about uh, whether you wish to use those powers and whether they impact on these families or that families or this income bracket or that un income bracket. But please not, let us not have a debate which says we don't have choices, because we, we absolutely certainly do. And I know James Donnan is not making that point in absolute terms, but I think it's important to recognise there's 
Mr Ross Greer and the Greens have done in, this, in opening this debate today, that those choices do exist. And I want to thank Ross Greer for the way in which he expressed um, his remarks earlier on. Uh, because this debate this afternoon follows um, the Finance Secretary's earlier remarks about the autumn statement, um, the, in some ways, because in, if Ross will forgive me, this is a money debate, um, then, uh, this, uh, then the best place to start is in the remarks that Derek Mackay made to Parliament uh, half an hour or so ago. And while I don't, of course, expect him to set out a budget, um, he's doing that in two weeks' time, what he did say in terms of commitments was uh, the, the com in relation to education and to spend in education, he mentioned quite specifically f to further expand early learning Learning and childcare to 1,140 uh, hours a year. Now, that, that I quite accept is the government's commitment they've made in the recent election, and, and they're quite right to seek to deliver that. Believe me, I come from a, a place in politics where it's a good idea not to uh, say things, or rather to deliver things you say you're going to deliver as opposed to not to. But the um, but the, uh, the important point there, perhaps, is uh, not just uh, for, in terms of Mr Johnson's remarks to reflect on what has happened, but actually the challenge for Derek Mackay and for his government in two weeks' time is to take on what Ross Greer said in his opening remarks, uh, which is uh, here are some uh, clear statistics which illustrate the demand for uh, additional support needs. And Mark McDonald made a f perfectly fair remark about the widening aspect of how we now judge that and how we deal with that in schools. That's perfectly true and therefore needs to be taken into account. But uh, given that, what I suppose many of us across this chamber who do care, as I suspect people on all political sides do, is how the budget will respond to that. That is going to be the test of any government. It will be the test of Mr Mackay as the new finance secretary when he outlines that budget. And I suspect in the context of today's debate, what Ross Green and the Greens are rightly saying to Parliament is that they believe this is going to be an important area to make sure there is spend in this area, which reflects that rise in demand that, uh, that uh, Daniel Johnson, Ross Greer and indeed in fairness to Liz Smith mentioned uh, as well. We, we may come from different places as to how we pay for that, but I think it's important to recognise that. One other point, if I may, to get me in under time, Deputy Presiding Officer, is I would urge in that uh, consideration, because I think it goes to the root of the remarks that Ross Greer was making in, in terms of how local government plan for this over the future, is as John Swinney will, I hope, concede, and as the Accounts Commission made clear in their report to Parliament this week, the, gov the Scottish Government have provided councils with one-year funding settlements in 15-16 and 16-17. For those of us who remember the halcyon years of three-year funding settlements, it, would, it wouldn't half be helpful if we went back to that. And I encourage Mr Swinney and his, and his ministerial colleagues to do exactly that. Jeremy Balfour, followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Depl uh, De Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I declare an interest as a councillor here at Edinburgh City Council? I think all parties, uh, as already have been said, want the best interest for every child and want the right support there for every child. As we've already heard, the number of children with additional support needs has increased over the last few years. I actually think that's good news rather than bad news. We have better diagnosis. We have better recording. But out of that, we also have to recognise that each child is individual. And if I can start where I left with my question with the Minister yesterday, to say, I, I agree that this government does believe the best interest of each child needs to be met. But I am not convinced yet that that has worked through to each local authority and to each officer within local authority. Too often, children will be labelled with a label. Yeah. If you have a certain condition, that is what the extra support needs you need. Rather than saying each child is different and should be assessed in what need he or she requires. It is vital that the need of a child is put first rather than any cost implication. When we're looking at additional support needs, we often and rightly focus on the classroom, what happens in that learning experience. But for certain children, actually what happens at lunchtime, what happens at break time, is as important, if not more important, than happens in the classroom. Social isolation can be devastating for a child, whether through a disability, a physical or, or mental, or through some other reason that we need that additional support need. That must be carried through, not only at the classroom, but to make sure that child is included in all the activities of the school and is not bullied when the teacher's back is turned. Uh, my colleague uh, Liz Smith has turned 
and spoken about mainstreaming. But there has been a 25% drop of special needs schools in the last seven years. And that does lead me to some concerns that where it is appropriate, and I accept in most cases it won't be, but where it is appropriate, is there actually a school for that child to go to? And I think we do need to look at the provision of special needs schools across the whole of our country. Because this is not an issue for Edinburgh or Glasgow or Highlands or whoever. It is an issue for the whole of our country. And I do think we need to make sure that parents and professionals and the child are consulted. But where that is appropriate, that that local authority does have a resource, either within its own area or within another area of Scotland, to make sure that that place is there. Finally, uh, presiding officer, can I turn to one other issue? And that is what happens once a child leaves the school. Because additional support needs are only working if that outcome is successful. And this is where I think the biggest concern must, must be faced by all of us. The number of modern apprenticeships started in 2014-15 by self-declared disabled individuals was 0.41%. If you look at those in employment between 18 and 24, that figure is 86 and even that figure is too low compared to the number of disabled people here in Scotland. So I would ask uh, the Minister um, and his team to look at why are people failing when they leave school to get into these apprenticeships and what access, extra support needs do they need, not just at school, but as they go on to college, university, apprenticeships or some other form of employment. Thank you very much. Monica Lennon, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I warmly welcome the motion from Ross Greer and the acknowledgement of the importance of additional support for learning in Scotland's classrooms. And I also declare an interest as a local councillor in South Lanarkshire. There is no doubt that additional support for learning teachers and support staff are absolutely vital to the successful development of children with additional support needs. Without this targeted support for those who need it, successful outcomes for children with additional support needs becomes much <coughs> harder to achieve and the extra pressure on teachers has an knock-on effect for the development of all children in the classroom. Making sure we have adequate support for pupils with ASN is crucial not only to their individual development but also to closing the attainment gap. But we've heard today repeatedly that resources are not keeping up with the needs of children and young people with additional support needs. And I hope this debate will persuade any member or minister who has been in need of persuasion that that simply is the case. We've heard from the official figures that we have for 2015 that over one in five children were registered as having additional support needs a big increase of 16%. As Ross Greer and, and Daniel Johnson have said, this is a positive that we have improved information about the individual needs of our children and young people, whether, as, as Mark McDonald said, it's a, a short-term issue or a, a longer-term additional support needs. But despite this better information, there has been no increase in numbers of support staff able to support children with additional learning requirements. In fact, as we've heard, the number of dedicated learning support and additional support needs teachers has significantly declined by 13% over the last five years. Um, it's now the lowest number that is on record. Over the past five years in primary, secondary, special schools and centralised provision, overall support staff is down by over 1,500, a decrease of 7%. This worrying trend, coupled with the fact that the numbers of children with additional learning requirements is on the increase, is what led the Scottish Children's Services Coalition to release the joint statement that they made this week, warning that we face a lost generation, a statement they haven't made lightly of children and young people with additional support needs, unless we reverse the cuts to public service and make further investments in education. So I would say it's to the credit of Ross Greer and the Scot Scottish Greens that they've used their parliamentary business time today to allow the fears of the Scottish Children's Service Coalition and parents to be heard. Yesterday, during topical questions, I raised the issue with the Minister for Children in Early Years, Mark MacDonald, 
And I was disappointed that he was unable to rule out further cuts to local authority budgets in order to protect the most vulnerable pupils. The Minister stated in a figure that's been repeated today that ASN spending across Scotland increased by 24 million in 2015. But that's an increase of just 1% on the year before. Of course, any additional funding for education and pupils with ASN is welcome. But the fact remains that we can and we must do more. Despite attempts to portray local government funding as rosy, the report from the Accounts Commission yesterday shows that councils will be facing a predicted budget black hole of £553 million by 2018-19. When the third sector, parents and ASN staff are telling us that children with ASN are at risk of becoming a lost generation, it's simply not good enough for the Scottish Government to look away or, or use Philip Hammond as the explanation for, for all of this. Professionals, parents and organisations across the children's sector are telling us that they need more than what is currently being offered. The Scottish Children's Services Coalition has made it abundantly clear that we must stop cuts to the public sector and increase investment in services to protect the most vulnerable. That's why I'm happy to finish and fully support Ross Greer's motion today. The last of the open speeches is Fulton McGregor. Mr. President, officer, uh, it's a pleasure to speak in this debate, and I would firstly like to thank you and indeed the Green Party for bringing this chamber, bringing this to the chamber, and giving me the absolute honour of being able to stand here in our Parliament on St Andrew's Day. Uh, it really is a privilege. President, officer, as others have said, there can be no doubt that the Scottish budget faces major challenges as a result of the cruel cuts from Westminster. And we heard a bit more of that, as others have said, in Derek Mackay's earlier speech regarding the autumn statement. It is a credit to the Scottish Government that areas such as additional support for learning have been protected as much as possible. Clearly, there are challenges in maintaining and improving the additional support needs provisions in our schools. However, I do believe it is disingenuous for our opposition parties to suggest that challenges are the result of budget decisions by the Scottish Government. For example, as others have mentioned, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition notes that there is an increased demand for additional support in our schools as, as a result of broadened legal definition of additional support needs as well as an increased identification of those needing assessment and intervention. And as Jeremy Balfour noted, that can only be a good thing. My own personal value base, I, I'm not really going to have time, Mr Johnson, because it's only four minutes. My own personal value base and experience leans me towards supporting inclusion wherever possible. I think that when a child is supported with his or her peers, this is in the best interest of everyone. And I do believe the Scottish Government have made good progress in this area. And I myself actually seen that in my own work uh, before becoming an MSP over the, over the period of time. As, as others have said, inclusion uh, includes a, a, a wide range of individuals. And to name just a few, uh, it can include individuals who have been bullied, uh, have behavioural learning difficulties, are suffering a bereavement, or are looked after by the local authority. And I know the Chamber has spent considerable time looking at, this, at that particular issue. And that brings me to my next point, that there are massive discrepancies in, between local authorities in terms of who they define as ASN with North Lanarkshire Council, my own area, being as low as 8%, compared with that being around 20% in some other local authority areas. And this fits in exactly with what constituents are telling me when they're coming to surgeries or coming to my office to meet me. A lot of parents are, are, are coming to me desperate, feeling not listened to uh, by the council, feeling that the child is not getting the support they need. And I've even had a couple of cases recently where parents have actually taken steps to remove their child from the education set up in a, in a bid to try and get the council to take some action. These parents are under absolutely no illusion. They're not coming to me as an SNP MSP blaming the government. They are saying the council are not listening to them. So I would go back exactly to James Dorman's point and say that yes, well, we've all got a role to play in this, that we need to look at where, where the actual decisions are being made. James Dornan also mentioned uh, North Lancashire's one-stop shop, and you know that's an absolutely fantastic service. Before its funding was cut by the Labour Council, uh, it was a, a, a service that covered my own area as well as all of North Lancashire, and and had fantastic results. I, I, as I said, I can't. It's four minutes, nearly finished. It's, it consistently got positive results, and uh, I have to mention uh, my ex-colleague, Councillor Rosa Zambonini. 
uh, with many parents who led up a, process, a protest against this closure, but unfortunately the local Labour Party would not listen. That said, I do need to say that the Hope for Autism um, organ organisations who I met at the Caring for Carers event at the Cope Bridge College campus, they have been absolutely fantastic in stepping in to the breach. Presiding officer, I, I believe that we must focus on the future of the recent decision of the Parliament to increase the rates of council tax in the four highest bands means that more funding will be available to th schools throughout Scotland and I expect that that will lead to more money being spent on additional support needs in schools. It would seem, presiding officer, Please. that on today, St Andrew's Day, the West Minister of Government had no intention of reversing the cuts and for me, there is no doubt that until such times this Parliament makes all of our own decisions about our own priorities, there is more strain to come for those most in need. And I welcome the commitment of this Government to increase have to close, in this Mr. Area. McGregor. Thank you very much. Uh, closing speeches. Ian Gray, absolutely no more than four minutes, please, Mr. Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I wanted to start uh, with uh, a, a point of, I think, underlying agree in a, agreement in the debate, but one which was examined to a degree by Liz Smith and Jeremy Balfour, and that is the presumption uh, for mainstreaming. I, I think it is the case that across the chamber uh, we do agree that uh, those with additional support needs should have their educational needs met in the mainstream. Uh, it's worth noting that it's not so long ago that that was not the case, and, and that's a change. And indeed, uh, if I'm honest, uh, my mind's changed a bit on this over the years. When I was younger, I was probably much more hardline and believed that absolutely everyone should be in the mainstream, uh, and I, I think I'm soft and uh, my view a bit. Nonetheless, uh, Ross Greer made mention of the fact that 95% uh, of pupils are in mainstream and that is considered uh, uh, outstandingly inclusive uh, internationally and I think that's something we can be very, very proud of. But what we have to understand is that the, the promise of mainstreaming only works if it is matched by the promise of the support that is needed in order to allow the young person uh, to achieve all that they can in their, that setting. I know this from my own experience way back in the, the 80s when I taught at Grace Mountain High School in this city. On that campus was also Came School, which at the time was the school for the, the partially sighted. Uh, and pupils from Cames would spend some of their time in mainstream classes, my class, my science class, and it worked incredibly well. It worked well because my class size was kept smaller to allow it to happen and because they came with specialist support staff as well who were able to assist them. But what happened over the years was that that additional support disappeared. Class sizes went back to, to their maximum uh, and the additional support teachers disappeared. And I knew then the service that was being provided to those young people was simply uh, letting them down. I couldn't do it. They're, so the service only works when we do not allow it to be squeezed by cuts. Uh, and my fear is that we are in a similar position now, today, now, uh, both the, the Cabinet Secretary and, and the Minister, I know, I understand uh, the challenges faced by uh, additional support need children and uh, are absolutely sincere, I'm sure, of course, uh, in uh, uh, their desire to serve them well. But I do think there has been a degree of denial. All of us who have constituents, I think, will have constituents who will have told us that support for ASN uh, pupils is shrinking, that pupils who perhaps had support for the whole week uh, a couple of years ago now will only have it for half the week, or who had a support worker to themselves will now be sharing that support worker with uh, somebody else or perhaps even two uh, other pupils. We heard on the media yesterday uh, people saying that was what was happening to their children. The Children's Services Coalition tell us uh, is happening. So I don't think we can deny that. Uh, and I say to Mr McGregor, I think actually it's not this side of the chamber that's been disingenuous. There's a certain amount of being disingenuous around that additional £24 million. Pounds. As Monica Lennon said, that's 1%. That's a real terms cut. And there are real cuts in additional support teachers, additional support workers. It doesn't matter which kind of support worker we look at we actually see that their numbers have been reduced. And that is a real consequence of the cuts to local government. And, you know, we can argue uh, about whether local government have had their fair share of cuts or more than their fair share of cuts till the cows have come home. The important thing is that I say to Mr Dornan in particular, as of today, this is our choice. We don't have to accept Philip Hammond's budget 
Mr. Dornan and his colleagues need to learn to feel the freedom, close, Mr. Gray. make their own choices, raise their resources, and support our children in our schools. I call on Ross Thompson. Less than four minutes, please, Mr. Thompson. Dear. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'd like to declare an interest as a serving councillor on Aberdeen City Council. Across this chamber, we do have the ambition to ensure that absolutely every child, regardless of whom they are, where they are from, or their circumstances, should be able to reach their full potential. We are aware that the responsibility for delivering positive outcomes for our vulnerable young people falls on the shoulders of our councils. Now, given the increasingly challenging financial situation that our councils are facing, we have seen council spending on in-school support for pupils fall by 11% since 2012, and funding for charities outside school has also fallen. This is despite in all local authority areas, with the exception of Shetland and also South Ayrshire, the percentage of children with additional support is increasing. This gives me actually an opportunity to talk about the work in my own area and talk about Aberdeen City Council, which has carried out a full review of inclusion, which concluded its work in August 2014. Now, the recommendations of that review are being implemented and some great progress is being made. The review highlighted that many children were needlessly traveling long distances to access appropriate support for their needs and that there was a lack of support in mainstream schools. Following approval of the reviews and the recommendations, the Council made a number of changes to help local schools to identify what interventions could be made to meet the needs of a wide range of young people and to ensure that additional resources were required were in place to meet those needs within a mainstream setting. Since 2014, the number of children with additional support needs that now attend their local school with their peers and siblings has significantly increased. And to touch on the point that was made by my colleague Liz Smith about mainstreaming, but also the important role of parents, is that we've actually seen in Aberdeen that as parents and carers have become more confident that individual needs will be met in their local school, there has also been a reduction in placing requests. Furthermore, the number of children being transported to a school out with their local area has reduced and continues to fall. The point uh, raised by my colleague Jeremy Balfour in relation to uh, not having a particular school to go to, I'm pleased that Aberdeen City Council are constructing a new 17 million centre of excellence for children with additional support needs. This centre of excellence is the first of its kind, will be a hub for best practice in supporting learners with additional support needs, providing a hub for outreach services such as speech and language, a new resource centre for training facilities, and a community hub for families and charities to access. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, as my colleagues have articulated in this debate, those of us on this side of the chamber welcome the increase in funding for the Scottish Government's attainment fund. However, rather than it be assigned to a particular school, we believe it should follow the child, and particularly those with additional support needs. We also believe this money should be allocated on an individual basis to be tailored to the needs of children with additional support needs. Some great progress has been made, but there's still work to be done, which is why we need to continue to work in partnership with agencies such as the NHS and the third sector, parents and the young people themselves to deliver a holistic service which truly meets the needs of young people, of children with complex additional support needs and ensure that that is delivered. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Call on Mark Macdonald. Uh, absolutely no more than five minutes, please, Minister. Uh, OK, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And we'll try and get through this uh, as, as best as possible because there are a number of points that have been raised. And I want to begin by thanking Ross Greer and the Greens for bringing this debate uh, to Parliament today. Um, obviously, uh, we have seen in the media this week the uh, comments regarding the Scottish Children's Services Coalition, uh, who I have met previously and said yesterday at topical questions that I'm happy to carry on engagement uh, with them. Uh, they have both identified the challenge but also identified, I think, opportunities uh, in terms of driving greater collaboration. Uh, I think that's something that all parties in this chamber have signed up to in terms of the public sector reform and Christie agenda. I think it's important that we examine how best we could take that forward. But let's look at some of the, the points that have been raised by speakers uh, in the debate today. Liz Smith uh, and a number of members uh, highlighted the issue around the presumption of mainstreaming. Um, and while absolutely we want to ensure uh, that children are uh, educated uh, in their local community where that is possible to be done, uh, it's worth noting that there are uh, within the legislation three clear exceptions uh, where it doesn't meet the need of the child, where it negatively affects the learning of other children or where there is disproportionate cost around mainstream provision. Um, 
we are revising uh, and reviewing the guidance around presumption of mainstreaming, and that will be undertaken during the course of 2017. Um, <clears throat> the, the point, uh, the debate got into a, a sphere where speeches from Daniel Johnson, James Dorn, and uh, Monica Lynn, and spoke about the concept of political choices, and they are quite right to talk about political choices. This government made a very clear political choice to uh, put in place £88 million, which was specifically to protect teacher numbers. Because what we saw, as Mr Dornan identified, was that unencumbered by that requirement, local authorities, in particular Glasgow, uh, were reducing teacher numbers, 4,000 teachers in Glasgow. Now, that was not a decision that this government took. It was a decision that those local authorities took. And just on the point uh, of political choices, uh, Monica Lennon and, and, and her colleagues on the Labour Ventures are quite entitled to stand up uh, and ask for additional resource. They then, when are told that additional resource has been provided uh, and in increased, complain that it's not gone up by enough. But then they also have the opportunity now at local authority level, they spent the last uh, almost decade telling us you should remove the council tax freeze. We have done that. We have enabled local authorities to make the political choice to increase the council tax if they feel that that would be a means by which they could increase the resources available to them. And Monica Lennon should know that her own local authority in South Lanarkshire have announced that they have no intentions in the coming budget to increase the council tax. So that is a political decision that they have made not to increase their revenues by increasing the council tax. So I just put that into context for the chamber when we're talking about the political choices that exist. Patrick Harvey uh, touched on the point around exclusions and I uh, would say that we are absolutely clear that exclusion should always be a last resort. We will be bringing out refreshed guidance uh, early next year, which will include a strength and focus on prevention and specific guidance on the considerations that need to be given uh, to children and young people with additional support needs. I met uh, this morning with uh, the National Autistic Society Scotland, uh, and that was one of the issues that came up uh, during our discussions around the issue uh, of exclusions. In terms of um, the approach that's taken in relation to teachers and teacher input, I think it would be fair to say, first of all, um, that it, uh, we, we have to ensure that we do not create the perception that those teachers who are not additional support for learning teachers are not in a position of capability to support and deal with some of the issues that children with additional support needs face. We've seen an increase in terms of the number of classroom assistants who are available to support those teachers. 111 uh, is the increase that we've seen in relation to classroom assistants. Um, but also, uh, teachers have a range of opportunities, both through initial teacher training, but then through continuous professional development to build those skills uh, in order to deal with some of the issues that they may face uh, in their classroom. Uh, and the point was made by, um, I think was it by uh, Mr. Johnson, about, oh, it's not about reducing bureaucracy, but the fundamental point about reduction, of, I'm sorry, I'm in my last minute, the fundamental point about reduction of bureaucracy is that it doesn't just free teachers up to be able to teach, it also frees teachers up to be able to undertake that continuous professional development, which enables them then to harness and enhance their skills. Uh, Ross Thompson uh, highlighted the situation in Aberdeen, and in relation to Jeremy Balfour's point around uh, special schools and, and the potential reduction in relation to those, I was going to highlight some examples uh, from Aberdeen, which of course is, is also my uh, local area. I would look at Mile End School and Bucksburn Academy. Now, these schools would not be classified as special needs schools, but within them there is a very strong additional support need provision contained within those mainstream schools. So there are different approaches being taken. But I will reflect on the point that Jeremy Balfour uh, has made. Um, Presiding officer, there yes. have been a number of uh, points made, which obviously I'm not having time to cover. I will look at the official report and will happily write to members if there are points which I perhaps need to expand upon beyond the debate. I call on Mark Ruskell to close this debate. A very tight six minutes, please, Mr. Thank Ruskell. you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to declare an interest as a councillor in Stirling with some uh, difficult choices to make, uh, Mr. Dornman, um, in the months to come over budgets. Um, I'd like to thank all the contributions, including from the, from the ministers as well this afternoon. Um, I thought we've had some very thoughtful contributions. And I think what all the speeches outlined is that um, there's a pressing need to ensure that every pupil every pupil with additional needs has the support in place to ensure they receive a high quality education. And if we're truly to meet this Parliament's aim of closing the attainment gap, then we must support all of our pupils to learn in the way that best suits them. And I welcome the, uh, the announcement there from the, from the Minister around the, the review around mainstreaming. I think that was an important point that was raised by, by Liz Smith and the Minister. Um, the number of children needing additional support has risen dramatically in the past five years, which was reflected on by a number of members. 
um, with one in five pupils now estimated to have uh, additional needs. And again, I thank Mark McDonald for pointing out that the definition of uh, children needing additional uh, support has been widened recently. And I think, uh, briefly, yes. Ian Gray. Well, the member note that the change in definition took place in 2010, but the increase of 16% uh, is since 2013. So that's not actually an explanation for the increase. Mark Ruskell point on board but I, I think the key thing now is to think about how actually we meet the needs of those children uh, that have been de um, defined as needing additional support and uh, you know there's a recognition I think that particularly under getting it right for every child that 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 centered approach on the needs of the individual is important Fulton McGregor however raised an issue around uh, the disparity in how we uh, identify those children with additional needs between councils um, I have to say, as a father of a child uh, with Asperger's myself, that um, the kind of early assessment that he got in P1 when he started school was excellent. Uh, and the kind of support from the professionals in the classroom and additional support workers and others has been fantastic. But I see those pressures now building up in, in the classroom over resources. Uh, and it's a concern for me as a father, as it is indeed for many uh, constituents who get in touch with me and members in this chamber. Um, now, we know that children with additional needs continue to have lower attainment than their peers and are more likely to be excluded from school, a point raised by Patrick Harvey. Those children are also less likely than their classmates to enroll in further education, training, or a job on leaving school. And I think Jeremy Balfour raised an important point there about the transition uh, from school out into the wider world that we need to uh, take cognizance of. And yet, with tightening local authority budgets, um, we have seen the number of highly qualified additional support for learning teachers fall by over 460 teachers since 2009. And I think you know, we need to perhaps pause and have a look at what is actually happening in the councils, because you know, we could argue about the causes uh, of some of the cuts that are coming through and whether Audit Scotland figures include NDR or whatever, or whether it's all Westminster's fault. But actually, the reality is that these cuts are happening, and it is time not just to stand still, but to reverse these cuts and to actually put the provision of additional support back into our classrooms again. I think it was a point made strongly by Ross Greer and Monica Lennon, and also by Ian Gray, reflecting on his extensive experience as well. And the reality is that when I talk to directors of education, they're under enormous pressure, James Dorn, and yes, there are local decisions that need to be made. But, you know, education, directors of education are the biggest budget holders uh, within local authorities. Uh, and although, yes, I recognise that teacher salaries as the biggest component of that biggest budget have been protected under local government settlement, the fact is that the other aspects of that education budget have not. And they are being cut, and there's I think it's an unintended consequence of that policy, because we're now seeing pressure on other areas within education. I think Daniel Johnson pointed out some of the impacts that are being felt in the classroom. Reduced budget for paper, reduced budget for caretakers, reduced budget for music tuition specialists and others. But it's particularly a concern of many of our constituents that these cuts are falling onto ASL teachers and classroom assistants. Now, I think we have got uh, some choices here. And Liz Smith talked about the flexibility that's needed within the Scottish Attainment Challenge Fund, which is an issue that I brought up in this chamber last week. And I'm glad to hear that you know, the Cabinet Secretary is reflecting on that and how we allow head teachers to have genuine flexibility about how that fund is used. I mean, that's a welcome step forward. But, you know, there's a more fundamental political choice here that's been raised by a number of members, including Tavis Scott and, and Ian Gray and Monica Lennon and, and my Green colleagues, which is that, you know, we have got a political choice here. We have got tax-raising powers in this Parliament. Yes, councils will now have the ability to finally raise council tax. It'll be interesting to see which councils actually take that up. But it's capped at 3%. It's capped at 3%. And I think with such an important topic and so many other pressures on local authorities, from health and social care, um, to, to the sale of assets and reduction of services, we need to, uh, we, we need to make progress. So um, the Greens motion today, I think, is a wake-up call to the Scottish Government that these vital posts in our schools cannot be overlooked if we're to make real progress on cl closing uh, the attainment gap. Training and additional support needs is not currently mandatory for teachers or support staff. So in raising more revenue for education, local authorities can also be in a better position to ensure more staff, both teachers and assistants, are better informed of how to respond to pupils' needs and behaviour and address any problems as they arrive. Presiding officer, while we respect that decisions on education spending lie with local authorities, 
Our call is for this government to provide them with the financial resources to address the growing shortfall in ASL in our schools, ensuring every individual child's needs are not just assessed and recognised, but are actually acted on to deliver their full potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes this debate. A few seconds to change over front benches, please.